Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see that this is like every other Sunday that I've been here when we spring forward. There's hardly anyone here. Everybody's taking advantage of that second. I mean, that uh, day when they when they said, oh, man, I messed my clock up. Well, look, it is 11 o'clock, and you are supposed to be in the house of the Lord today. Now, if you're not there, you need to explain that to him. I don't need an explanation. But uh, you are supposed to be in the house of the Lord this morning. But if you've been following along with us today, um, we're in the third chapter of Galatians. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 20 today. Third chapter, verse 15 through 20. Uh, if you found your place with me in the word of God, I would invite you to stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word this morning. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And I, and this I say, that covenant was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul it, and it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God. Y'all can be seated. Wow. Pretty tough scriptures this morning, you think, you would think. But uh, we'll get right in with 15, brother, and I speak after the manner of men. Okay, what's Paul saying there? He's talking about the law of a man, right? And what actually is he, he's speaking about is a will and testament. Um, what does it say there? Though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. What's he talking about? He's saying if you've got a will and you die, then the judge is going to enforce your wishes, right? He's going to make sure that, that no man stops your wishes from being fulfilled, right? He's going to say, hey, uh, Dickie left a million dollars to Mark and He's going to get that million dollars. Seriously. The, uh, the will and testament of a man is probably the most sacred document. They can fall uh, under the scrutiny of an attorney, but if it, ha if it has been stamped and properly notarized and sealed, then you can be assured uh, that document will stand for law, right? Even a man's document. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So what in the world are we starting to talk about? <clears throat> well, to understand the promises and, and what he is actually talking about to the Galatians here is God making promises to men, covenants to men. God saying Thus saith the Lord, and it being so. So we're going to look at covenants today, and so I'm going to bounce you back to the Old Testament, Abraham, uh, I mean Genesis, excuse me, uh, chapter 5, verses 6 through 18, and we're going to look at a different, a very difficult scripture text, but I think after we look at it here a minute, you'll understand what we're talking about. Genesis chapter 15, we're going to start um, there at verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now I want you to stop there for just a second. Abraham did nothing, did he? No works. Think about it. Abraham was called out idolater. His parents were idol idolaters. God chose him and called him out. 
And here Abraham believed God and it's what? It's counted unto him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord. Now he's been counted righteous. Righteous, right? He's already been counted righteous, I can see. And he said, Lord. Whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? I'm going to get my stuff messed up here. So what's old Abraham saying? Well, how do I know, God, that this is the truth? How do I know that I'll inherit and my seed will inherit this land? If that's what he's asking. Uh, most people wouldn't have nerve enough to ask the question, but oh, Abraham did here. So God gives him a a directive, uh, a set of instructions that he wants him to follow. He said to him, take me and a heifer of three years and a, a she-goat of three years and a ram of three years and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took them uh, unto him all these and he divided them. He killed them, right? He cut them in half and laid each piece one against another but the bird uh, divided he not. And, of course, 11, the fowl came down. So he, he cut all these animals, right? And he laid the pieces, the halves, with the exception of the birds, in the end. Like a gauntlet, if you will, right? Halves. Right? You lay them end to end, as God instructed him to do. <coughs> and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham, and lo... And horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abraham, um, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom uh, they shall serve will I judge. And afterward uh, shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go um, to thy fathers in peace, and shall be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, thou shalt come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet fulfilled. It came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, here's where it gets interesting, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Wow. So, Brother Mark, where are you going with all this? What smoking lamp is going between the pieces? Well, the vision is, is God, okay? He's moving between the pieces. In between the gauntlet, right? What's he saying? Well, Abraham asked the question, whereby shall I know that, that I shall inherit this? How shall I know, God, for sure you're going to keep this covenant? So he cuts all the pieces, he makes the gauntlet, right? Then God puts Abraham to sleep, and the burning pot moves between the pieces. God made a covenant that day with Israel. Now, what is going on is this picture. God is walking the gauntlet between these pieces of animals that are torn asunder. But what is God really saying? Yeah, this is good. He can't promise by the heavens, mother. He can't promise by his mother. By the grave of his mother. He doesn't have a mother, right? He can't promise those things. He can't swear by those things. God, you can't do it. You can't promise by the heavens. You can't promise by the earth. <clears throat> what he is saying is look at these pieces that have been torn apart. Ultimate mutations, right? When you cut something apart, it is no longer what you had in the beginning, right? It is mutated. It is cut. What God is saying is May I be torn asunder if I breach my word, if I breach my promise to you. That's what he's saying. He said, may I be muted. We know God is unmutable. He never changes. It's one of his divine characters. What's he saying in his promise? May that mutability, unmutability be taken from me. That's what he's saying. Think about what he's saying.
May my eternality become temporal. My omniscience become ignorance. My impotence become my omnipotence become impotence. If I don't keep my word, because God can swear against nothing else, who do you swear by? He swear he swore against his own being. You know, when God makes a promise to us, Christians, when God makes you a promise and and he says, Thus saith the Lord, believe me. He can swear by none greater. If a man can keep a will and testament, why would we as Christians think our God and doubt our God can keep his word when he gives it to us? May he be torn asunder. We're talking about God. That's how serious he is about a promise that he made, uh, that he made to Abraham then. And since he doesn't change, all the promises in his Bible, uh, you can bank on them. Uh, may he be torn asunder. Think about what he said. Uh, may he lose his omniscience. May he lose his, his omni, omnipresence. May he, lose it, may he become impotent. May he become not powerful, not all powerful. Think about what he's saying. Uh, these uh, attributes, these divine attributes that your God has, our God has, they make him different from anyone, anywhere. And he's putting them on the line to tell you that you can trust what he said. You know, when God makes a promise, what's he doing? He's sealing it with his own being. Think about that. When our God makes you a promise, when Jesus says, if I go, I'll go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again to receive you. Believe me. Uh, God would have to be tore apart for him not to come and receive you. God would have to be tore apart for him not to make Donnie's Mansion on the north side of Hallelujah Boulevard. Right? When? Let's get into some promises. God's going to make here, and I, I want to labor this uh, with you today because, you know, Christians fail in their life sometimes uh, because they're not relying on the promises of God. You know, uh, I've got a niece in Texas, and we were talking about this before service, and we've been praying. Uh, she's got her daughter, uh, Parker Grace, and uh, doctors didn't give them much hope. And, uh, we've all been praying all across the United States, all the churches and my brothers and sisters in Christ have been praying, and God delivered that child, 10 month old child. Why are we astounded when God moves? Why are you surprised when He answers a prayer for you? Jesus said in John 3 16, For God so loved the world, gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Promise from God. You've got to believe in Him, though, right? Let's look here. Let's look here at some of these promises. Lost my place. Romans 10. That thou shalt confess with the mouth, thy mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Wow. And if you were confused about that verse, in 13, 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be <coughs> saved. What's it take to be saved, mother? You've got to call on the name of Christ. Well, that's the good parts of some of the promises that we've talked about. This book is full of promises. These 66 books full of promises. Well, you know, I couldn't be a good Baptist if I didn't give y'all a little hell and damnation today. Let's look at another promise God makes here from Revelation. Revelation 20, uh, 21 here. Verse 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire 
which burneth for ep, excuse me, in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Listen. Verse 15. And whosoever not found written in the book of life will cast where? Into the fire. Just as God said to you, whosoever shall call upon my name shall be saved. You can bank on this. If they don't call on his name, uh, they'll be in the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. If that's getting to you, I'm sorry, but I'm not really sorry. It needs to get to you today. You need to be thinking about what's going on today when our God makes a promise. And you say, well, I don't believe in God. I don't. Your belief is not a prerequisite to, to your destination. It's not a prerequisite to your destination. You can go through this life and say, I don't believe in God, to your purple in the face. Your knees are going to bow, and you're still going to confess Christ as Lord. I promise you, on the authority of the word of God today. And I promise you, if you die that way, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. And that fire will never go out. And there is no end to your torment. The Bible says the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Amen. Or truth. And God makes a promise. He's serious about it. He's provided a way out uh, for the human race. He's, he's provided a way out for your sinful heart. Uh, he's given you Christ. Uh, oh, what a gift. And all that's necessary for a person to come to Christ what? What did Romans say? Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. It's no more difficult than that. A child can understand it. Uh, but we have adults that struggle so hard with it. Amen. But believe me, the promises that God has made <coughs> will come to pass. Right. You can, uh, we can, we can say they won't and stick our head in the sand like an ostrich, but I promise you, they are going to come to pass. He'd have to be torn asunder. Think about what he said to Abraham. He would have to have himself torn asunder. He would have to quit being God, if you will, for one of his promises to fail. Just one. I think I've labeled promises enough here uh, for the moment. Uh, so let's uh, get on into 17. I say this, that the covenant uh, that was confirmed before God in Christ, uh, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. What's he saying? Well, some 400 years, 30 years after, 430 years after uh, Abraham, the law was given to Moses. Okay, but does the law make what he promised Abraham of none effect? Absolutely not. Okay, God cannot lie. He will not breach his promises. Uh, Titus 1, 2. God, the only thing God can't do, Donnie, is lie. And look, the more we talk about this and the more you realize that every promise he made will come to pass, the more in love you ought to be with him every single day. For if the inheritance of the law is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore, uh, the then serveth the law. It was added because of the transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. What in the world is he talking about? Why was the law given? The law was given then. It still has an application today. What does the law do? Convict. It convicts. Right. It tells you and me when we have sinned against God. Right? It, it convicts you. Uh, if God's not convicting you, you've got a problem. You've got a soul problem. You hear me? Right. Right. And don't tell me you're not sinning because I don't believe that. I'd like to live with a, per a, per with a perfect person for just a day. But don't tell me you're not sinning. Uh, if you look on a man or a woman in lust, guess what you've sinned? If you've told a white lie, I promise you, white lies are the same as dark, ugly lies. There is a lie is a lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Let me tell you something. You've lied. You've breached the law. You, you are a sinner, in fact. 
And there's not one person that you know that has not committed and breached God's perfect law. So the law is for one thing. It is to convict you and to keep letting you know of how depraved our souls really are. We are to pay attention when the Spirit convicts us. We are to repent of what we're doing. We're not to continue in it. Uh, you're not to continue in your sin. Uh, God paid too much for you, I assure you. Uh, but we are to understand why the law is here. It has always done a perfect job. The law has never saved a soul. Oh, man. What are you saying, Brother Mark? That's all they had. Look, I can't help it. It has never saved a person's soul. The only thing it does, and the only thing it's ever done, is to let them know how deceitfully wicked in their heart that they are and let them know that they need a Savior. Jesus Christ is the only one, has, on, has ever been the only one that can save your soul. He's the only one qualified. Was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Look, I'm going over in 21 there, but y'all need to get this. The law does not conflict God's promises and covenants with his people. It does not. There is no conflict in the Godhead. There is no conflict. The only conflict is between you and I when we twist the word of God. We need to be careful and never twist his word. Uh, we need to be careful and represent him every single day in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So, uh, how do we want to conclude today? Uh, let me tell you something. When God promises you something, it's absolutely going to happen. Uh, you may say, Brother Mark, now, now, I might not see every prayer I've prayed for. You might not. But you can be assured Brother Robert, when he was alive, me and him prayed for your brother, mother, Jimmy, a lot. <laughs> Probably every time this church met, me and him prayed for Jimmy and prayed for Jimmy's salvation. Now, Brother Robert went home, but I guarantee you where he is today, sitting up there with the Lord, he knew that Jimmy accepted Christ as a personal Savior. I didn't say you were going to see every promise fulfilled, but you can be assured that when God promises you to see he's going to do something, it's going to uh, we can be assured that if we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. Look, that's something to bank on. I don't care what happens. Well, you say, Brother Mark, I've backed it and I don't care. Once saved, always saved. God cannot, he cannot break his word. If he says you're saved, you're saved. I don't care if you backslid. You need to get your heart right and repent of your sin and get back to serving God. I don't care about all these excuses. I care about you accepting Christ as your personal Savior. He's promised that if you will, he'll come back and get you. Brother Donnie, he, I don't know. He's got a lot more work to do to get him on the south side of Hallelujah Boulevard, but we're going to work on it. But, uh, you know, we're not saved by our works. Uh, but we're saved by works. Are y'all want to throw me out of the pulpit and stone me? <laughs> we're saved by Jesus Christ's work. He's the only one, the only one that could save your soul. The only one that kept that law, those Ten Commandments, perfectly, in spirit and in truth. Think about it. Not only did he keep them physically, on the outward, brother, but he kept them in his heart, perfectly. When I think about how sinlessly perfect Christ is, you know, I'm kind of like old Peter. I want to hide my face. Compared to me. I want to have my faith. But Christ kept them sinlessly perfect. All those commandments. His work makes you righteous before the sight of God. Not your work. Not ever your work. And not my work. Not anything you and I have ever done. Can make you righteous before the sight of God. It is Christ's work and Christ's atoning work alone. That's it. At the end of the day. But know this. If you're his. Can't lie. I don't care if this world passes away. He's coming for you. Uh, I don't care when your death is. You'll be ushered to heaven 
by the angel. Amen. Do not die without it. Because sure as you do, this, as sure as you do, you'll face the judgment. There's no way out. Um, if, you, if you don't know him as your Savior, and you're out there with, in the internet today, or if you're here and sound my voice, listen, today is the appointed time. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised 20 seconds from now. Right now is the time to accept Christ. And what did Romans say? Thou shalt call upon the name of the Lord. Thou shalt be saved. Admit your sin or agree with God that you've fallen short of his of the commandments. You've fallen short. You've sinned. Agree with him. You know you've done it. I don't have to preach that to you. You know you've told a lie. If you told one lie, then you're guilty. Agree with him. And ask Christ to come into your heart and save your soul. Wherever you are. I don't care where you are. And then find some good old-fashioned church. Somewhere where somebody's preaching the gospel. Every Sunday. And you stay in there and you serve the Lord. And drop us a line. Let me know you've accepted him. I'll be sure to pray for you. Would you stand with me and we'll have a moment of prayer.